Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson. Tonight we just landed from Helsinki back in the nation's capital where it is hot and intense. We're going to have our full extended interview with the president from Helsinki. And we're going to show that to you in just a minute. We asked him, of course, about Russia, but there are, believe it or not, many more important and pressing issues on the world stage, not just Russia. And we asked the president about those as well. We'll bring the whole thing to you coming up in just a second. But first, tonight, with remarkable speed and intensity, the media, the foreign policy establishment, both political parties have come together as one to attack the president for his meeting yesterday with the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. Anderson Cooper, John McCain, Mitt Romney, they all described the president's remarks about Russia as disgraceful. Former CIA director John Brennan called those remarks treasonous and grounds for impeachment. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer announced that Trump was being blackmailed by a foreign power. Others accused him of being a sleeper agent, a spy. One member of Congress from Tennessee called for a military coup against the presidency. Well, as the rage storm swirled, the president bowed to the inevitable, genuflecting before U.S. intelligence agencies whose judgment must never be questioned and recited the now obligatory oath of loyalty to the spy bureaucrats now in charge of our country. Watch. In a key sentence in my remarks, I said the word would instead of wouldn't. The sentence should have been, I don't see any reason why I wouldn't or why it wouldn't be Russia. So just to repeat it, I said the word would instead of wouldn't. And the sentence should have been, and I thought it would be maybe a little bit unclear on the transcript or unclear on the actual video. The sentence should have been, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be Russia. Sort of a double negative. So you can put that in, and I think that probably clarifies things pretty good by itself. So that's the hostage tape. The president buckled to criticism. I don't know what they're saying. That's exactly what happened. He buckled. And that happens. This is politics, after all. What is amazing and unusual and ominous is who made him buckle. The people yelling the loudest about how the Russians are our greatest enemy and Trump is their puppet happen to be the very same people who have been mismanaging our foreign policy for the past two decades. The people who invaded Iraq and wouldn't admit it was a mistake. The people who killed Muammar Gaddafi for no obvious reason and prolonged the horrible Syrian civil war and then threw open the borders of Europe. The ones still defending the pointless Afghan conflict and even now planning brand new disasters around the world in Lebanon, Iran and yes, in Russia. These are the people who've made America weaker and poorer and sadder. The group whose failures got Trump elected in the first place. You would think by this late date they would be discredited completely and unemployable, wearing uniforms and picking up trash by the side of a turnpike somewhere. But no, they're not. They're hosting cable news shows. They're holding high positions of influence at the State Department. They run virtually every nonprofit public policy institution in Washington. They are still, in some sense, in charge of our national conversation. And naturally, they hate the idea of rethinking or correcting any of the countless blunders they have made over the years. And that's one of the main reasons they hate Trump, because he calls them on those blunders. Now, being Trump, he can't always explain precisely what he means to say. Sometimes he gets the details wrong, or he gets sidetracked with some personal vendetta, as if anybody cares about that ridiculous Jim Acosta guy. Nobody does. But on the big questions, Trump is indisputably right. The Cold War is over. The world has changed. It is time to rethink America's alliances and to act in our own interest for once. Russia is not a close friend of the United States. But the question is, why should we consider Russia a mortal enemy? Of course Russia spies on us. So do a lot of countries, some of them far more effectively than Russia. The Russian attempt to meddle in our election was comically amateurish. Badly targeted Facebook ads almost nobody saw. Compare that effort to the deep penetration of American industry and the defense sector by the communist government of China, or compared to the remarkable sway that the Sunni Gulf states have over our political process, or the fact that Latin American countries are changing election outcomes here by forcing demographic change on this country at a rate that American voters consistently say they don't want. Those are all major challenges from foreign powers to our American democracy. They're real. And yet somehow nobody on cable news seems upset about any of it. Why is that? Well, here's one reason. Many in Washington are getting rich from the Chinese and the Saudis. Latin Americans clean their homes and watch their kids. Those countries can't be our enemies, in their view. But nobody here is getting rich from Russia, so therefore Putin must be a mortal foe. 
That's what the neocons are telling us we are required to believe. Does anyone actually believe it? Well, no sober person who's read a newspaper this year could recite that talking point without laughing because it's stupid. So the only option if you want to force the population to accept something ridiculous is to make sure they don't think too much about it, that they're quiet, they do what they're told. And if you don't believe it, watch what's happening to Trump right now. Obviously, it's possible, entirely possible, maybe likely that the Russian government broke into the DNC servers before the last election. It certainly sounds like something they might do. But before we act like we know for a fact that that's what happened and go to war with Russia over that, shouldn't we see some actual evidence that it happened? Why not? Like maybe a server or at least a clear explanation of what happened. We haven't seen that. And that's what Trump asked for. How dare he? That's a treasonous thought, we were told. He's a quisling, a traitor to his country. That's what they're saying. And not just a few of them. All of them are saying that in unison. Think for a second about what they are demanding. If you don't automatically accept the imprecise, nonspecific, never fully explained findings of shadowy intelligence agencies with long, documented track records of making serious mistakes, you've somehow betrayed your country. The very people who assured you that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, the ones who said the Shah would never fall in Iran, et cetera, et cetera, those people must be believed without question or else. On television, this group is called the Intelligence Community. That's an Orwellian name if there ever was one. Where exactly is this community we hear so much about? Does it have a zip code, a public library system, a youth football league? How long before Congress starts demanding unthinking obedience to the lawmaker community? It's a community, after all. You must obey it. Dissent is unpatriotic. And if you don't agree, you're working for Vladimir Putin. That's where we're heading, by the way, and fast. In some ways, this whole story is about Donald Trump and what he's said and what he does. But on a deeper level, it has nothing to do with Donald Trump. This is about democracy, whether or not voters rule their country. It turns out the very people telling you they are saving our democracy are working overtime to destroy it and scolding you as they do. Yesterday, we asked the president about this, along with many other issues. Tonight, we're running fewer commercials and airing our extended interview with the president. Here's part one of that conversation. Mr. President, thanks for doing this. Thank you. The reaction to your press conference in Washington was swift and intense. Former CIA Director John Brennan described it as treasonous and a, a potentially impeachable offense. Why the push toward conflict with Russia in Washington on both sides? Well, I think Brennan's a very bad guy, and if you look at it, a lot of things happened under his watch. I think he's a very bad person. Uh, I also think that when you watch Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, when you watch all of the things that have happened in Com happened Comey, you take a look at that, and McCabe, who's got some pretty big problems, I assume. Uh, you look at the deception, the lies, what's gone on in the last fairly long period of time before I won. I mean, long before I won, during the campaign, I guess probably during the uh, Republican, you know, when I was fighting against uh, 17 other Republicans. So this has been going on for a long time, but these are people that, in my opinion, are truly, they're bad people, and they're being exposed for what they are, and it's a shame that it has to happen, but it's really hurt our country. Their view is that the United States is forever in conflict with Russia, which is our chief global adversary, and anyone who doesn't believe that is betraying the United States. Without taking up whether that's true or not, why do you think there is this bipartisan consensus on that in Washington? Well, it's sort of incredible, because you'd look at World War I and World War II, that was Germany, and in World War II, Russia lost 50 million people and helped us win the war. And I was saying to myself the other day, I said, you know, Russia, really helped us. I'm not pro-Russia, pro-anybody. I just want to have this country be safe. I don't want nuclear weapons, uh, even people thinking about it. You know, Russia and the United States control 90 percent of the nuclear weapons in the world. And getting along with Russia, and not only for that reason, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Are they our chief adversary, would you say? Well, they're strong military, uh, but their economy is much smaller, as you know, than China. And I don't want to even use the word adversary. We can all work together. We can do great. Everybody can do well, and we can live in peace. But uh, I think it's very, very important, you know, and, and I've watched your show a lot, and I see how you're talking about the, mag really, the magnificent size of China. You look at the size of what they've done in a fairly short period of time. That's because of a lot of bad leadership on behalf of the United States. We allowed that to happen. We allowed them to make hundreds of billions of dollars. 
And right now, as you see, and you probably have noticed, that things are happening. We have to bring it more into line. We have to level the playing field between the United States and China. And we've increased our net worth. We've increased our worth by more than $7 trillion since the election. And we're about twice the size of China, our economy. But China still is a massive economy. They have the second biggest by far. So NATO. NATO was created chiefly to prevent the Russians from invading Western Europe. Sure. I, I think you don't believe That's Western true. Europe's at risk of being invaded by Russia right now. So what is the purpose of NATO right now? Well, that was the purpose. And uh, right? it's OK. It's fine. But they have to pay. And they weren't paying. And other presidents went and they'd make a speech and then they'd leave and nothing would happen. And, you know, the fact that they didn't pay is not, you know, new. It's not a new fact. This is something that people have known for a long time. Other countries were delinquent. You know, in the real estate business, we use the word delinquent. They didn't pay. They didn't pay for past. So I went there three, four days ago and I said, folks, you got to pay. Because we're not going to pay from 70 to 90, and I think 90 is really the right, you know, depending on the way you define it, 90 percent. We're not going to pay 90 percent of the cost to defend Europe. And on top of that, the European Union kills us on trade. We lost $151 billion last year on trade. They don't take our product. They don't take our farmers' beautiful goods. They don't take our cars. And if they do, the rate of tax is many times what we would charge them. We only charge them 2.5 percent. Uh, their tax, their tariff is, is very substantially right. higher. I mean, in the case of China, we charge 2.5% when they send a car, and when we send a car into China, they charge us 25%. How is that fair trade? You know, people say, oh, we want to keep, we don't want tariffs, but how is that fair when one country gets 25% and another country gets 2.5%? And by the way, the one getting 25 doesn't even want the cars. They want them to build those factories. They want those factories built in China. They want those factories built in Europe. So now we're doing things that have never been done before in this country, and you see what's going on. It's been very pleasant so to watch. So membership in NATO obligates the members to defend any other member that's attacked. That's so right. let's say Montenegro, which joined last year, is attacked. Right. Why should my son go to Montenegro to defend it from attack? I Why is that? I understand what you're saying. I've asked the same question. You know, uh, Montenegro is a tiny country with very strong people. Yeah, I'm not against Montenegro uh, right. or Albania. No, by the way, they're very strong people. They're very aggressive people. They may get aggressive. And congratulations, you're in World War III. Now, uh, I understand that, the, but that's the way it was set up. Don't forget, I just got here a little more than a year and a half ago. Right. But I took over uh, the conversation three or four days ago, and I said, you have to pay. You have to pay. And the Secretary General said that because of President Trump, last year we had an additional $44 billion, with a B, billion dollars raised for NATO. And this year, it's going to be much more than that. And the countries all agreed. It was very unfair. They weren't paying. So we're not only are we paying for most of it, but they weren't even paying. And we're protecting them. Add that to your little equation on Montenegro. As you traveled around Europe and looked at Europe over the years, can you think of a place that has been improved by mass immigration or the uh, movements of large numbers of refugees? Not one. Not one. And in fact, one of my big things, and some people were insulted. I'll tell you, a year ago, they would have been totally insulted. Now, maybe there could have been a couple out of all of those countries. I said, the immigration policies in Europe are a disaster. You're destroying Europe. You're destroying the culture of Europe. Uh, the crime is up in those areas. And you better do something. I tell them that. I said, look, it's not me. It's not anything. You just look at the numbers. The numbers speak. But the culture is changing rapidly, and the crime rate is changing more than rapidly. You better do something. I told them that. What are the lessons for us watching that? Well, we have to be very strong on the border. Now, we're much stronger than we ever were on the border, and our numbers are much lower. But still, uh, we're getting the wall. We're going to have we're putting in for about $5 billion. We've already started the wall, $1.6 billion. Uh, it started in San Diego, California. It's almost completed in that area. And by the way, the people were really asking for it. You know, it's interesting. They probably uh, go down as, oh, we don't want the wall. But when it came to their backyard, they wanted that wall, and they wanted it up fast. But we've started the wall. We are going to continue with the wall. It's so necessary. But we have to have strong immigration policies. Our laws are so bad, Tucker. Somebody comes in. And they step on our land. And now we end up with a court case that takes seven years, but the people never show up to court. It's so bad, and we have to do something about it. Like, if they come into our land, we have to say, I'm sorry, you have to leave. 
not, I'm sorry, please come to court. We're going to put you in court. You'll come back in three years for your trial, and then they never show up. That's, what, that's what's happening now. It's crazy. Why do you think so many political and cultural leaders in the United States disagree with you and are making the case that borders are themselves immoral? It's incredible. I mean, the Democrats are for open borders, which means crime. It's, it's not a question of, like, you know, what do you think it means? Open borders means crime. And uh, you look at uh, MS-13 is pouring in, and we stop them better than anybody else could. But when they get through, and then we send ICE, because ICE is tougher than they are. And now I understand there's a big move to try and get rid of ICE. But MS-13, these are tough, vicious people. They don't like guns. They like using knives better because it's more painful. These are vicious people. And you, you know the story. You cover it plenty. And ICE goes in, and they get them out. They get them out. They put them in jail, or they throw them out of the country, and they don't even think about it. And now there's a move on to get rid of ICE because ICE is tough. If you don't have tough people doing that job, you're going to have crime like you've never seen it. So uh, it, it is incredible. The Democrats want open borders, which is basically saying we want open borders, we want crime. Why do you think they want that? Uh, maybe it's a political philosophy that they grew up with. Maybe they learned it at school. Maybe they're fools. I don't know. We'll have part two of our exclusive extended interview with the President of the United States in just a minute. But first, Professor Stephen Cohen is one of the famous Russia experts, the eminent Russia experts in America. He's Professor Emeritus at NYU, was at Princeton for many years, now a contributing editor at The Nation magazine. And he joins us tonight for some perspective on this conversation about Russia. Um, Professor, you have followed this country for 50 years and know many of its leaders personally. Give us a sense of what's at stake in this conversation about Russia for the United States. For 75 years, the President of the United States, beginning with Roosevelt, has met the leader of the Kremlin. Beginning with Eisenhower in the atomic age, the main purpose was to avoid war with Russia. Right now, we are in a new Cold War fraught with hot war from Ukraine to the Baltic region to Syria. President Trump did not have a choice. He had to go, as his predecessors did, to meet with the leader of the Kremlin, Putin. And he did. We don't know exactly what they decided. We will learn. But never, never, not only in my lifetime or history, has a president coming back from doing his duty to avoid war with Russia been greeted with this pornography passing as news analysis in commentary. He is literally being called traitorous, uh, treasonous. And I don't know what we're going to do, because if we can't discuss the issue, how can we think about our policy? But there is a good piece of news, and I'll state it quickly. Ever since the Soviet Union ended, relations with Russia have gotten worse and worse, and now we are where we are. And we ask ourselves, why did that happen? Communism is gone, the Soviet Union is gone. And the answer here is always, it's an orthodoxy. It's, it's biblical. You can't dissent from it without being accused of being pro-Kremlin. The answer is, Russia's to blame. Putin's to blame. The United States has done nothing wrong. And now, the President of the United States has said, some, has said something absolutely heretical. He said it first in a tweet, and then after the meeting with Putin. And it was very simple, but it was profoundly true. He said, we have bad relations today because both sides are to blame. And I think that's what underlies their fury at him, that he has become a heretic in the American policy system. He has, he has challenged the fundamental axiom Yes. of American foreign policy for 25 years. Well, and it's stupid. I mean, what, what's true in foreign relations is true in marriage. It's always a joint effort to screw something up. Um, so quickly, <laughs> it, it is true, actually, well, um, as you know. But I'm, not so, go, I'm not going there, no matter what you say. <laughs> Give us a sense, quickly, of the consequences of what's at stake here. I think for a lot of Americans, this is a political story, but it's also a geopolitical story. This is a country with a lot of weapons that sees the world very differently from us. So what are we playing with here? All right, leave this Russiagate aside because I can't find a fact to support it. What President Trump has done, and in this regard, though I didn't vote for him, I say three cheers for President Trump. He has said, look, we are in a dangerous situation with Russia, and it's not that just Russia that's to blame. We are to blame. We did wrongheaded things back in the 90s. 
and sense. What we need to do, this is me speaking now, having acknowledged that, is have a discussion of where our policy toward Russia went wrong. First under Clinton, then under Bush, then under Obama. It is a fully bipartisan, but what Trump has given us, if the media would allow him, is an opportunity to rethink. And if you don't rethink, how do you get policy right? And if you don't get policy right, we are talking about war. Yeah, well, this is a city like Seinfeld that refuses to learn anything, ever. <laughs> Professor, thank you very much. It's great to see you.